everybody and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video we are looking at political authority and government of Nicholas II. In particular, or the main focus of what I'm looking at is um, the contents and, and outcome of the October Manifesto and the four doomers and how they worked or probably to be more accurate how they didn't work because we are looking at the government of Nicholas II so most of what we look at is, is it not working. This here fits in with the key question from the spec on how was Russia governed and how did the political authority change and develop. So we're going to crack on and we're going to have a look at a whole range of different bits. So it comes from this particular um, bullet point in the spec, political authority, government of the Tsar Nicholas II as a rule of political developments to 1914, which is what I'm particularly looking at, and to my government that I'm particularly looking at. There are already videos on the channel on the 1905 revolution and uh, its causes and its events uh, and on Nicholas II and, and, and what he was, um, was like as a ruler. Again, there's a video that goes through all of that. Uh, the short answer is, is not very good. So there's been a revolution in 1905. It has not overthrown the Tsar, but instead it has led to concessions. And these concessions take place in the form of the 19, uh, 1905 October Manifesto. So the mani manifesto was drawn up uh, by Witt, he, who went on to become the first prime minister under Nicholas II. And it was a response to the criticism um, uh, and demands of, of the liberals, but also to the fact that he was facing the revolution with the general strike and, and um, demonstrations in major cities and peasants uprisings in the countryside. So he had to do something about it. The October Manifesto was published on the 30th of October 1905. It granted freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly and of organisation, so things like trade unions. It also proposed the formation of an elected National Assembly called a Duma. Now the Liberals have been calling for this for years and so they were ecstatic. They were really, really happy. Uh, and it would, this would have the power to approve and reject proposed legislation. So it looked like it was going to have uh, real teeth. So at this point, the vast majority of liberal opponents of the Tsar were, were then prepared to call off their support for revolutionary activities. They thought they'd been uneasy. They'd not been particularly happy um, kind of get, going in side by side with revolutionaries anyway. They didn't really want a violent rebellion. They wanted reform. They wanted the, the Tsar to listen to them. They wanted to have some kind of political say. And so this splits the liberals from the social revolutionaries and the Marxists. And again, these are really important revolutionary groups. And again, I'll look at these in more detail in future videos. So what's going to happen next? So there's the manifesto. It seems that the liberals are, are on board. There's another key group or other key groups he needs to get hold of. Now, the vast majority of the Russian people are still peasants. So there has been industrialization, but the the kind of urban working classes are still not the major group of people in Russian society. Now, the Russian, the, 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 the Tsar promised to cancel redemption payments. This was one of the big bugbears, one of the big concerns of the peasantry. And so this goes down rather well. It wasn't the only cause of peasant unrest. However, it was a big concession and enough to reduce the amount of violence and opposition that was taking place in the countryside. And the peasantry instinctively was loyal to the Tsar. They, they, they wanted to see the best in him. They didn't really like the intelligence, the revolutionary ideas and stuff that, 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 that was coming. But they would be, God says, they were so unhappy with the way they were being treated and the way things were. But if they could have the Tsar back on, on side and they could, they could get concessions from him, then even better. I mean, it, it tended to be the case that they hated the local landowner and members of the nobility rather than genuinely hating the Tsar. So they were prepared um, <coughs> to accept the concession. It would lead to improvement in their personal finances and, and meant that they could feel that they were in line, for example, with the teaching of the Russian Orthodox Church, that they were, they were abiding by the Tsar, their, their little father. There is still the need for repression, however, because there are groups who are not going to be bought off by some some of these concessions. So the social revolutionaries who mainly uh, try to work with the peasantry and the Marxists or, or SD made up of, of um, Bolsheviks and Mensheviks were, after the split of the SD in 1903 were not impressed. Trotsky, uh, a, a leading uh, revolutionary, described the October Manifesto as a whip wrapped in a parchment of a constitution. 
and so he still sees the Tsarist regime as being horrendously repressive, and those revolutionary groups have not got what they wanted. They want a revolution, and so they're going to keep on going. Now, another important part that's going to link in with the repression is, is that the army, which had largely remained loyal um, to, to the, the Tsar, was now heading home. So the Russo-Japanese War had ended disastrously, but it had ended in August, and that meant most of the troops were now returning from the east. So he's got more army coming back and he can concentrate his forces on the on these these revolutionary groups because he's bought off the liberals and most of the peasantry. And so the, the kind of return to Tsarist repression is going to work because it's going to be a group that he groups of size he can handle rather than when it's the whole population, which had been in you know, 1905, which he couldn't. So we can see a degree of, of opposition, but, and then also rather worryingly, um, signs of support. Um, so we've got the St. Petersburg Soviet, mostly made up uh, of Mensheviks and some Bolsheviks in SR, uh, and the, the leader of the leaders of the Union of Peasants, which is mostly SR. They will they all get arrested. Um, uh, and the last act of resistance, Bolsheviks organized an upri uprising in, in Moscow in, in December, but this was easily crushed by loyal troops and about a thousand rebels were killed. And so the revolutionary side of it seems to be petering out. The, the combination of concession and repression seems to be working. And, and the Tsar has allies. And so there's this party created, this rightist group uh, called the Union of Russian People. It was a new political party formed in, in 1905, right wing uh, Russian nationalists. Uh, and they got some backing from the Tsar and his government. They also used this group, the Black Hundreds, these violent thugs that, that attacked opponents in the Tsar. They were in horribly, horribly anti-Semitic. In de December 1905, they were in the southern city of Odessa. Uh, 500 Jews were murdered in a three-day pogrom. Uh, and they also attacked striking workers, uh, any rebellious uh, peasants or students. And so they start to smash out the, the last remaining bits of this revolution from 1905. And, and doing so really rather effectively. As things went forward, there's, there's our, you could tell the, 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 the October Manifesto he is not saying from his heart. Actually, he, he, he said that, it, that in his heart he spat on it, really, uh, and, uh, to quote him. And, and he, so he doesn't like it. He doesn't like what he's been made to do, but he can see that he's had to do it. As he's regained control going into 1906, and he sees the fact that he can step back from the reforms that he's done, and he introduces the fundamental laws. These, these were aimed to strengthen his new position within the Constitution. And in principle, he, he retained autocratic control. He could veto uh, any laws proposed by his Council of Ministers. And Article 87 uh, of the Fundamental Laws gave the Tsar power to, to rule, rule by decree in exceptional circumstances uh, uh, when the Duma was not sitting. Now, obviously, what deems, is deemed exceptional circumstances is going to be left to the Tsar and his ministers. And we will see Article 87 being used in this next period uh, as a mechanism for the Tsar and his, and his ministers, people like Stolypin, getting what they want. The Council of Ministers was as one to the Tsar, not to the Duma, and only the Tsar could appoint and dismiss ministers. And so we start to see this proposed power and influence uh, that the Duma is going to have. We see, see it starting to collapse very quickly. And then this kind of reformer that was in, in the system, Witt, who, who had, had been the author of the October Manifesto, he was forced to resign. Uh, and so we start to see um, conservative reactionary influences at court start to re-emerge and take take power of it. It's kind of a theme we've seen in Tsarist Russia. We, again, we saw it with, the, with Alexander II, didn't we, where he, he'd push towards reform and then the reactionary influences in court would rise up again and pull him back and pull him back and pull him back further. Same thing's happening here to Nicholas. A bit is replaced uh, <coughs> by uh, Gormaikin uh, and he's an old-fashioned conservative. He, he, he wants to uphold Tsarist autocracy just as the Tsar does and so the fundamental laws show his fundamental shift away from the kind of liberal reforms that are promised in the October Manifesto. 
Now, there are a number of political parties. The fact there are political parties at all, obviously, is, is a big deal. We've got the Octoberists, who are main, mainly wealthy, moderate conservatives who accepted the October Manifesto. Uh, we've got the rightists, and we've, we've seen their main, uh, their main group, uh, the Union of Russian People, who is very pro-Zar, pro, pro the Black Hundred violence, and therefore going to be a key kind of ally of the Tsar in the Duma. Well, this, the cadets, now they're a fairly moderate party, they, they are a liberal party, uh, they propose things like full civil rights, uh, they want the parliament to have, have real power, the Duma, uh, they want a constitutional monarchy, so the monarchy more like we have in the UK rather than the, the autocracy of the Tsar that we have in Russia, and they want to see some redistribution of land, and the cadets are, are going to be a major force in the first of our Dumas. We've got the uh, the Trudeviks, who are, again, they're a, no, a non-revolutionary party. They split from the SR, who were uh, a, a revolutionary party. Uh, they, again, are, are pretty liberal. Um, they want to see nationalisation of non-peasant land. They want to see an eight-hour day for workers. They want to see a minimum wage. But, again, they're in a position where they, the, if the Tsar was willing for concessions and negotiations, they're, they're kind of ones that could have pushed... Uh, Russia on a, on a route towards modernization and reform. You've got the progressives who were largely businessmen again who favoured moderate reform but nothing too dramatic. Uh, you've got the national parties who, who were voted for in places um, like uh, like Poland and elsewhere Ukraine and, and they so they represented nationalist parties they were again often quite um, right wing but they, they were mainly concerned with trying to gain some degree of independence for their part of the empire rather than um, reform in other ways. We've then got the revolutionary parties. We've got the SD, which had split in 1903 into the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. And again, we will uh, look at those in more detail in other videos. And we've got the SR, who are kind of the leftover of the populace. They, they wanted a land distribution and, and they were largely uh, supported by the peasants. So the SR tend to be, they get their support in the countryside, while the SD tended to get their support in the towns and cities. So there are four Dumas. The first Duma is, the, is often referred to as the Duma of national hope. So there is great excitement. This is something new. This is something that's going to make a big difference. And they, the reforming parties were the biggest ones there. The cadets with 182 seats, uh, the Trudeviks with 107. But we see really bitter debates early on between the reformist parties and those that supported the Tsar. Um, and because and we see groups like the rightists and others in there uh, on such issues as, as, as civil rights and land ownership. Nicholas is horrified by the whole thing. He's horrified by the demands of some of the deputies, um, by the, the criticism's voice against his government. There's also quotes from him and the Tsarina about um, the way that they dressed, um, the, the, their manners, um, the way that they smelt. Uh, things that he just wasn't used to in his palaces. Their address to the throne that included demands for universal male suffrage, redistribution of land and abolition of the death penalty, as well as the giving up of these emergency powers that, that seemed to give too much power to the Tsar, uh, didn't go down very uh, very well with Nicholas. And he saw this as an absolute no. Now, he, he had this loan of, of 2,250 gold francs from France, and that meant he did wasn't reliant on the Duma to raise taxes or anything like that. So he could kind of rule without them. He remarked, curse the Duma, it's all Witt's doing, and, and he dissolved uh, the Duma in, in June, and he considered it completely uh, unworkable. So the first Duma looks like a bit of a bust, and it, it then seems to get a lot worse from there. So we get the, what's known as the Weiberg Appeal. So in response to the dissolution of the first Duma, about 200 deputies, mainly the cadets, travelled to Weiberg in Finland, where they, they issued an appeal to the Russian people. They urged them not to pay their taxes or perform military service. Um, it had little impact. Um, the Tsar responded by arresting many of the deputies, banning them from standing in the next election. So this is going to really hit the cadets going forward. And... and so the Tsar seems to have got his way for now. Um, now, the failure to control the Duma to, to, to Gominkin being um, sacked, he got dismissed, and he was replaced by Stolipin. Now, Stolipin had built his reputation as a real hardliner. Remember, we, in the previous video, we looked at the fact that um, the hangman's noose was, was, was nicknamed Stolipin's necktie for the way that he dealt with opposition. 
Uh, and so he, he was about to um, re-control, uh, and he'd done this in, in Saratov, where he'd taken tough measures against their opponents, and the, and the belief was that he could do this uh, on a wider scale. And so the Tsar sees this, he's got this hardliner in place, he's going to get the whole thing under control. Now, the problem is that the voting system remained the same. So we get a second Duma, and it's often referred to as the, as the Duma of national anger. So the Russians did not yet lose faith uh, that the Duma could do good, so they went out and they voted, and the election turnout was really good. So the Socialist Revolutionaries took part for the first time. They won 37 seats. Uh, the SD, in, in, in this case, the, the Mensheviks increased their number of seats. So we are seeing proper revolutionary groups with seats in the Duma. The Trudeviks remained strong, and, and although they, they lost about half their seats, the cadets were still the second largest party, despite uh, having um, uh, so many of their, their previous um, deputies banned from standing. So the, the reformist parties on the left of politics were still a strong force in the Duma, but the right wing were also strengthened. The Octoberists, uh, in particular, who had strong support from Stalipin, uh, more than doubled their number of seats, uh, and Russian nationalists within, within national groups also won more seats. As a result, the Second Duma was completely polarised, so, something uh, we can be familiar with in politics, so you've just got two sides shouting at each other. Uh, and it, it, therefore it's very argumentative, it doesn't really get anything done, and, it, and it's really hard to control. So Stalipin goes to Article 87 of the Constitution, uh, and so he decides that he will use this when the Duma is not in session, and he, he this angered the left wing. He used it to pass agricultural reforms, um, and then he used reports and a plot to assassinate the Tsar by the Social Democrats as an excuse to dissolve the Duma. Um, and he was determined that, that going forward he'd get a Duma that worked. So he he created a, 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 a Duma in preparation for the, the next election, and what he did is he used Article 87 to radically change the rules on voting in order, in order to weight it towards the nobility and the landowners. And the landowners went from getting 31% of the final vote to 50% of the final vote. The peasants went down from 42% to 23 The workers received just 2% of the vote. So it's sometimes referred to as Tlipin's coup. And so this use of Article 87 is really important. So the Doom of, Nas uh, Doom of National Anger, the second Doom, which was full, of, full of, of anger and revolutionary groups, once that's gone, the next stage is going to give something that is far more palatable for Tlipin and for the Tsar. The third Duma gets the rather lovely nickname of the Duma of Lords and Lackeys, and that's because of this change in the makeup of it due to Tlipin's coup. And this third Duma, therefore, is a lot more right wing, is a lot more conservative, is a, a, a lot more pro Tsar than the first two. It, it is dominated by the Octoberists with 154 seats and the Rightists with 147. Now, not everything that comes out of this is, is negative. Sleepin is happy, he's got, he got his way, and he's able to start actually introducing some reform. So there is land reform. Uh, there, there is education, um, an education law that extended uh, uh, primary schooling. There are improvements to the army and the navy. And the really, really unpopular land captains are replaced with justices of the peace. Uh, a, a national health insurance scheme to pay for sickness benefit uh, to workers is set up. So Stalipin really is showing he, he's more than just a hardliner. He's not just somebody there for, to work on the, the Tsar's side and crush opposition to the regime. He, he actually has got uh, kind of genuine credentials as a reformer and somebody who, who's going to improve things for, for the Russian people. Now, a lot of this might be to um, prevent uh, opposition. A lot of it, the the opposition groups, or all, all the opposition groups are going to say it's not gone far enough and Stalipin is going to remain really, really unpopular. But actually, the Octoberists, for example, in 1911, so to object, saying that his reforms were going too far. And so Stalipin has to resort to his old tactic of suspending the Duma and using Article 87. And he, he used this, for example, to, to introduce the Zemso system in Poland. So Stalipin does seem to have some, some kind of reforming inclinations, but it is, it is also not really perhaps a Democrat. 
The leap in um, time in office comes to a rather untimely end. He, he attended the opera, and if you need any more reason not to go to an opera, there's one. It, it, bad things can happen. So he went to an opera in Kiev. The, the Tsar and, and a couple of his daughters were there as well. Um, but there was also a left-wing um, revolutionary who shot him. Um, showing that the, the revolutionary left-wing groups had clearly not forgiven him for the harsh repression used in 1906 and 1907 and the coup in 1907 that he brought in, uh, which changed the voting system, and they didn't really think his reforms uh, were good enough. <laughs> Having said all that, the, the Tsar seemed actually not necessarily to be enormously disappointed at the, the loss of, of Stolypin, uh, because there was increasing unhappiness about his reforms. Uh, the, the assassin, a, a, a guy called uh, Bogrov, um, was a socialist revolutionary, but he'd also got connections and, and, and supposedly worked for the Tsarist secret police, the Akrana. So it's not completely clear whose orders the murder was carried out on. So we've got a degree of mystery in all of this and a bit of a bit of debate. So Stolypin... He was a, a, a he was a strong he was a hard line guy and he saw the need for modernization and for change in in all of this he manages to annoy people on on both sides one of those sides had him killed which side it is we're not a hundred percent certain so there's the fourth duo this is more lords and lackeys because of the voting systems the leap in had created is still in place uh, and now it was it was starting to be clear that the Duma was pretty pointless. Um, the, the, if, if the Tsar wanted to get around it, he could using uh, Article 87. Um, the Fourth Duma didn't make any real significant contributions to policies and decisions of this period. Uh, and once World War I started, the Duma mess, met less and less frequently. Um, I didn't really have any influence over the war effort. The workers lost faith in the Dumas, really. I mean, the so number of strikes increased significantly from 1912 to 1914. Uh, most significant clash of this period is known is the one in, in Lena Goldfields, known as the Lena Goldfields massacre. 200 striking workers were killed by Tsarist troops. They were protesting about the degrading conditions that they were living in, what they were being fed, where they, where they lived, and also the fact they were paid very, very little and had to work a 14-hour day. Uh, outrage at this massacre uh, inspired more strikes and more protests against workers, and we start to see uh, the Bolsheviks starting to gain some ground, and, and their newspaper Pravda was, was was starting to be more widely circulated. So through all of this, there are some positives. So political parties were legally established in Russia for the first time ever. And there was some open political discussion, again, something that's a major shift from what we've seen so far. It was tolerated. It was reported in the press. So none of this seemed particularly conceivable in the world before 1905. Furthermore, there were some actual decent reforms that would help not only the Russian economy, but to a degree, the Russian people. And these takes place, ironically, during the Third Duma, after Stolypin had manipulated the electoral system and made it less fair. Obviously, there are lots of negatives as well. Uh, the Tsarist uh, government and Duma had a very problematic relationship. The Tsar doesn't believe in democratic government. He believes he's an autocrat by God's will and he should remain an autocrat. And because him and a lot of his advisers and the nobility believe that to be the case, they're, they're always not really embracing uh, constitutional reform. The reformist parties in the Duma also, they, they share some of the blame for what goes wrong. They failed to develop a working relationship with, with the Tsarist government. They, they failed actually to work together. These divisions in the left were absolutely catastrophic because they spent as much time fighting each other and attacking each other as they did attacking the people on the other side on the right or attacking the Tsarist regime and this division and it goes all the way back to uh, the time of the revolution in the October manifesto in 1905 this division in between those who opposed the Tsar let him in really they, they let him keep control the 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 liberal spirit from the revolutionaries he he repressed uh, the revolu revolutionaries, the, the the different groups in the Duma argued with each other and allowed 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 other things through. There wasn't that there wasn't this, the kind of solid push and rejection of the fundamental laws. So there are lots of negatives in it. I mean, as I've said, and as I've said, there there were some positives. There is some movement forward during this period. 
Thank you very much for watching. I hope that's uh, been helpful. This is part of my uh, series looking at Tsarist and Communist Russia going from 1855 and I'm, we're going to end up all the way forward in 1964. So <laughs> we're only part of the way through and I, my intention is to keep on going with these videos, adding them to, the, to this playlist on my channel. So if you want more on Russian history, then uh, please subscribe. If you haven't done all, uh, already, if you think other of your um, friends or classmates or other teachers will benefit, then please hit share or if you just think anybody else might be quite interested in it. If it's been useful for you, please hit like. Thank you very much again for watching.